Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you have something that you pick up that you just don't want to put down? That you hold it with all, all your might? You know, why do you pick it up? Because you, you enjoy it. And maybe it's a, a variety of different things. Maybe it's a, a book. Maybe it's a gaming controller. Maybe it's a fishing pole. Maybe it's a hand. Or, or maybe it's something different entirely that I haven't mentioned. Maybe it's even a, a phone that you hold. Why do we hold on to these things? Why, why, why do we hold on to them for longer than maybe what we would like to? Well, because we enjoy it. We, we like it. Maybe you think about a book that you're reading and you think, oh, I can't stop now. It's, it's getting to the good part. Or, or maybe you're playing a game and you're at the middle of the campaign and you can't put down your controller. Or, or maybe you are fishing and you're getting bite after bite and who would put their fishing pole down then? Why do we hold on to it? Well, because we like it. We enjoy it. But would you think about putting something down that you love and picking up something that you loathe or hate? That, that sounds kind of crazy. We, we probably wouldn't do something like that, would we? Because we want to hold on to the thing that we love. We don't want to be holding something that we don't like. But that's what our God says to us today. He says to us, put down what you love and pick up what you loathe. Jesus had just left the house of a prominent Pharisee. He had a meal with this individual and others. And now what does Jesus do? We are told what Jesus does. A large crowd were tra traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said. So Jesus went out once again on his journey, and there's a large crowd that's following him. And we might be thinking, okay, why is this large crowd following him? Are, are they, you know, just following because they have nothing better to do? Are they following him because they want to listen to him speak? Or do they want miracles or, or great things to happen? But were they expecting some tough lessons today? I don't know if they were. You know, with school starting up, you know, for some and others about to start up, you, you think about Jesus' class that he gives today. And, and Jesus' class isn't some kind of like first day class where the teacher eases you in nice and slowly, no. It, Jesus' class is like jumping into a master's course on the last day and, and trying to swim through, through it all. And so Jesus gives uh, several lessons here today. But the first one is this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. So I, I know what you're saying. You're saying, whoa, whoa, Jesus, <laughs> what are you saying? You want me to hate my father and mother, my wife and child, uh, my brothers and sisters? What Do Doesn't that go against the fourth commandment? Doesn't that go against the fifth commandment? And, and Jesus, you want me to hate my own life? Doesn't that go also go against the fifth commandment? Jesus, what's going on? Jesus, what do you mean? This is, again, a hard saying and a hard truth, but maybe we, go, we could go to a variety of different passages in the Scriptures to help us. But instead, we'll go to Genesis, where we encounter three individuals, Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. Uh, Leah and Rachel were the wives of Jacob. And maybe you can recall that biblical account of how that all unfolded with the trickery that was there. But after they were married, we hear this, especially about Leah. So when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, so by Jacob, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So there that word hate is in this English translation. And so we might be thinking, okay, well, why did Jacob hate Leah? But it's not the kind of hate that you think of immediately. Instead, it should be more translated, you know, Leah was loved less. Leah was loved less than Rachel. 
And so what is Jesus saying to us about hating our fathers and mothers, <laughs> wives and children and all of that? Well, he's saying, you need to love me more than them. You need to love them less than me. And this might impact your relationship with others when you have a relationship with your God. Maybe you'll lose some of those relationships. Maybe you will have to put them down. Maybe you might have to love them less. You know, this is what Jesus is trying to make us think. Where is our heart? What are we holding? Are we holding others, other things, other people? Or are we holding our Lord. So it, it, it seems tough to us, or maybe I should say it, it seems hard, but the sad reality is that Jesus might cost us those different relationships that we have because we want to love our God, because He deserves our love. He deserves all our love, more than anything or anyone. But you might be saying, you know, this seems too tough. It seems too difficult. Well, Jesus understands the challenges of being a, a Christian. He, he says this, And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Do, does a cross sound nice? Do you, do you want to carry a cross? Well, you might say, uh, I, I don't mind carrying a cross if it's jewelry around my neck or if it's some kind of decoration for my wall at home. But do you really want to carry a cross? Well, what is a cross? It was an execution tool that the Romans used, and it was probably one of the worst means to kill somebody. You know, essentially, you think of like the electric chair, you know, that's kind of the equivalent. And then as you think about the cross, you think about Jesus' cross and what he had to endure. He had to endure death and great suffering and pain and spiritual suffering of hell on the cross for all of our sins. So we appreciate what our Lord has done. But as we carry our crosses, you know, and love Jesus more than anything else, we must carry our crosses through it all. And as we carry our crosses, we can't just pick them up and put them down during the middle of the race. You know, you must carry these crosses all the way to the end. No matter the challenges or difficulties, we can't say, oh, this is getting too tough, I'm going to put down my cross and just be done. No. We, we must hold on to that cross. We must hold on to that cross all the way to the end. And Jesus illustrates this for us with a few different illustrations here. He uses this one. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. There are many instances where projects were not finished. Some are famous, or maybe we should say infamous. Uh, but you, you come across these uh, projects that were not finished, and it doesn't look good, does it? There are several that you can look up online. One of them that I found was quite interesting. It, it didn't involve a home or a sky-rise building of any sort. Instead, it was a subway in Cincinnati. Uh, or, or that was the hope. The project started in the early 1900s, and they started kind of tunneling the, for the subway. And then all of a sudden, the Great Depression hits. And then the war. And the price of materials and work skyrocketed to the point where they didn't have the finances for it anymore. And so the project was eventually scraped and, and, and given up. There was about seven miles of tunnel dug or graded, but no track was ever laid. I found one comment about the project that, that said this. It was one of the city's biggest embarrassments. So if someone can't complete a project, it doesn't look good. You need to complete the project. But, you know, you think about our faith. 
carrying our cross. We can't just start carrying it and quit. We have to finish. We have to cross the finish line. We have to have the Lord bring us to our heavenly home by His grace and mercy. And then Jesus goes on with another illustration. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. So again, like the builder, the king must kind of assess his situation. He must understand what kind of resources does he have, and if he's not well equipped and goes into battle, what could happen? He could lose the battle or the war. He could lose his kingdom and his soldiers, his great wealth, and, and so much more. But his only hope, if he is not well equipped, is to essentially plead for mercy and say, you know, <laughs> please spare us. Please sign a thing of peace. And if the enemy is not merciful, they will be wiped out, obliterated. We have to understand who we are. We have to plead to our Lord, Lord, show us mercy. Lord, lead us to our heavenly home. Lord, help us to be on your side by your grace and mercy. Jesus brings all these hard truths back home when he speaks in verse 33 here. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Do, do you wonder what the crowd was thinking? You know, Jesus, are, are you speaking to me? Jesus, are you saying that I have to give up everything? Jesus, am I a, a follower or a disciple of, of yours? This is not the first time Jesus has spoken this way. You know, he, maybe we think about the rich young ruler and what he said to him. He, he said this, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Again, Jesus is saying, put down the things of this world. Pick me up. Hold on to me. That's what matters now and for all eternity, and Jesus is speaking to you and me. What kind of things have you put down for Jesus? Maybe you put down a group of friends that you enjoyed hanging out with, but they didn't use good language, or you know they talked about Jesus poorly, or their actions were far from what the Lord requires. Or maybe you put down a job that had little morals in the business. You didn't like how they were cheating other people out of their money and not giving them what they deserved or paid for. Or maybe there are other things that you have seen in your life or other people's lives where you say, okay, I'm going to put this down. Maybe it's the bottle or some other addiction. Or maybe you're playing a game and it goes against the sixth commandment. You say, huh? I'm not going to play this game. What kind of things have you put down for the Lord? But well, well, there's a piece of all of us in our heart that, you know, kind of desires to pick those things back up. You know, we, we, we kind of fight with ourselves daily. You know, I'm not going to pick that up. I'm not going to hold on to that because I'm holding on to something much better, my Lord. But then our sinful nature gets the best of us. And then what happens? We pick it up. And after we've picked it up, we quickly realize, oh boy, this is going to be hard to put back down. I'm not going to be able to put it down. And so we hold on to it more and more, maybe out of guilt or maybe in stubbornness because we want this sinful thing. And then we quickly realize you know, we've put down the Lord and we're holding that sinful thing and we're distancing ourselves from the Lord, maybe slowly or maybe even quickly. And we find ourselves not wanting to go back to the Lord. 
we find ourselves loving the things of this world more than we should. Those things becoming idols in our lives, and they can be, again, a variety of different things that maybe you know for yourself. That's why the Lord says, put down the things that you love. The sinful things of your heart, distance yourself from them. Isn't it interesting that the Lord has a good way of speaking to his people, speaking to our hearts? Yes, certainly the people that are in church, but even to those who are not. I think it's interesting, the past several weeks, if you picked it up, the Lord has been speaking very strongly to those who are not coming to hear the word. And if they're not here to hear it, you know, what a challenge that is to work on their hearts, this word, and say, you know, what are you holding on to? What do you love more? Do you love that thing, that person? <laughs> Sleep, your job, more than your Lord? Yes, the Lord speaks to you, to me, and those who are not here to listen. He speaks to all of them. He hits us with that law and tells us, yes, you've broken the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. You haven't loved me more as you should. You haven't always loved me the most in your entire life. Yet our Savior concludes with this. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Well, what are these ears, your ears, supposed to hear? We're supposed to hear that law that works in our hearts, but we're supposed to hear that gospel, that good news about our Savior, Jesus. And we think about our baptism as our ears were opened, as that water poured over our head, and we were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our ears were opened, our hearts were opened to God's word, and we were made children of God. And so we ask the Holy Spirit to open our ears, to open up our hearts, to understand the truth that our God loved us and was willing to put down everything for you and me. He put down his heavenly home, he put down his power and his glory to come here. And to pick up what? His cross. He, he picked up his cross for you and me so that he would suffer, yes, physical pain, but again, that hell that he also suffered there for us. To pay for your sin. To pay for mine. To pay for all of the people in the world. Thank the Lord, he, he picked up his cross so that we could have eternal life, so that we would put down the things of this world and pick up and hold on to the salvation that was placed into our hands by God's grace. Jesus has given us so much, given us life forever in heaven. And so this is the reason, as Christians, we struggle to put down those things. To, to not pick them up again. And to understand when we do, we say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for the wrongs I have done. Lord, I kneel before your cross to understand that I am forgiven, that I have life with you. Lord, help me struggle with carrying my cross all the way to the end with your help and mercy. Hold tightly to your cross. Hold tightly to your Savior. Hold tightly to the salvation He has given you. Amen. Please stand.